Have you ever found yourself between a rock and a hard place? Maybe just in a pickle. Amen? It, doesn't that mean the same thing between a rock and a hard place or maybe in a pickle? How about sitting on a powder keg? Sitting on a powder keg? In a predicament? Some of you been in a predicament? Catch 22? Anybody? In hot water? Ever felt it was a no-win situation? Crunch, dilemma, woo! Those words, what do they mean? Between a rock and a hard place. Well, that came to me this week as I was studying and coming back uh, off vacation and, and I began to study and uh, those words just kept speaking to me. There's something that you and I need in our lives today, every single one of us. There's something that the world needs. Now, you and I already have it. We just forget about it. Now, I, I believe that because we have to be reminded of it. The world doesn't know what it's like and that's why they struggle so much in their life is they, they just have no idea. And what it is that we all need and the way that we can go on in life, the way that we can face so many trials and tribulations and struggles is we need hope. We need hope. Hope carries us through struggles. Hope carries us through problems. Hope carries us through dilemmas. Hope carries us through catch-22s. Hope carries us through a rock and a hard place. So I begin to wonder, you know, as I always do when I, I remember these things, I remember my granddad using that phrase, between a rock and a hard place. So I was, I was trying to figure out what's, what's a rock and a hard place. So I, I do what everybody does in the generation today. I Googled it. Google said between a rock and a hard place actually was something that occurred out in the ocean when this boat was coming upon the land and, and there was this huge rock and to get to where they were supposed to go they had to go through this tight, narrow passage but they were warned that the ground was very solid on the right side and the rock was on the left side and you had to navigate very carefully to get between the rock and the hard place. And so that's carried forth. Now, I also read other things that people would say about it, but it gained my attention because sometimes I find myself in life between a rock and a hard place. Don't know how to deal with things. Don't know how to take things. All the things that take place in my life. Sometimes it seems like everything in life is negative. You ever notice that? The devil wants us to be that way. He wants us to take everything in a negative way. Everything that happens to us, everything that goes on in our lives. And sometimes as we deal with life and we get up on Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday and Friday and even Saturday and Sunday, there's just so much negative. I mean, if you don't think there's enough negative in life, just turn on the TV. Watch the nightly news one time. Just, just one time. You, you never know about all the negative that's going to go. You know, you hear about stuff all the time. You, I, I think it was Friday night. There was a drug raid here in town. The young man, he was, uh, they think, uh, got quite a bit of uh, eth, uh, amphetamines and other drug paraphernalia. And these, these things just happen. I remember, I think I read Wednesday or Thursday where a suitcase come through the Nashville airport and it was full of drugs and they were able to confiscate that. I mean, it's just, it's just negative. A home invasion. I read of a home invasion and it just seems like uh, home invasions are becoming more uh, common you know uh, where people just breaking in homes knocking on doors and all these things it's just so much negative in fact I was talking to a pastor friend yesterday on the phone Many of you know him, Adam Brown, pastor of Temple Baptist Church in Central City, and Adam's a friend of mine. And his cousin, Marquita, and her husband, Mark, was a youth pastor with Lori and I at New Hope many years ago. Mark's the one that, uh, that actually committed suicide a few years ago and killed himself. She's also the sister to Chad Watts, uh, Watson that actually had the fire over in Graham a couple years ago and lost his wife and several of his children. 
Well, they had another family situation happen this week. It was on Friday morning that two cousins, two brothers were at a work site down in the Graham area. And one brother told the other brother he'd bought a new pistol. said, bring your pistol to work. I'd like to see that pistol. And I've been seeing posts all day Friday from the family about something that happened and, and tragedies hit our family again. So the one brother brought the other pistol, to, brought his pistol to work and he was breaking it down. The other brother said, here, let me show you how I break my down so he took the pistol away from his brother and he was breaking it down and taking it apart and guess what nobody did nobody checked to see if it was loaded so the gun went off the other guy standing there as a witness said nobody pulled the trigger but it went off as they were taking it apart and one brother shot his other brother so they were able to call the ambulance and get some blankets from a neighbor because there was no cell phone service in the Graham area. And by the time the ambulance got there, the gentleman passed away, 20-something-year-old young man with a daughter. And his brother stood over him, and his brother kept looking him in the eyes and saying, I love you, I love you, this is an accident, please don't, don't worry about this, everything's okay between us, you know, we were just checking the gun out, please, and, and he died. And so I was talking to the family, I talked to two of the family members yesterday, and they said, Brother Gary, is there a curse on our family? With all the bad things that's happened to our family, with all the stuff that's happened, and now a 20-some-odd-year-old's 20, 20 gone, a young man was a fine young man, hard worker, father of a little girl, taken out in, in a, at a young age. I, I mean, I could take time. It, is the world negative to you? Or is it just negative to me? I mean, when you see all the things that's going on, it just seems like everything is negative today. And, and if we're not careful, we get in that rut of negativity. And when we do, it affects us as people. It can affect me. It can affect you. I mean, when, when we begin to look at all the things that's taking place in life today and, and all the problems that even our church family, I've noticed over the last several months all the things that's going on in, in people's lives and some of you that are walking through some very difficult journeys and I, I see you here today, you've walked through some unbelievable journeys. Joan L., I, I think of you and I pray for you and what you are walking through and have walked through in that tragedy and even in your own life in your health. Joy Kaufman, I, I think of you and, and Kenny and I, I pray for you and, and I think of your journey and what you're walking through right now. Tracy, I see you this morning, brother. God bless you. You and Tandy, we love you. And we're praying for you and your journey too and what you're walking through. See, I, I've not even got through one section and I know I even skipped some people. See, Rachel uh, Heron fell off a hay bale last night. You see that the Herons are not here today. She fell off a hay bale last night on the youth get-together out at, at, at the pumpkin place and she's broke her wrist and her hand. They're going to be looking at what they're going to do that trying to set that tomorrow. You know, I, I can just, just continue to walk through. Benita, God answered prayers with you and we're praying for you and, and mobility and 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 I just and I just can come to the next section and Lance and and his journey and what he's walking through and and, and dealing with and, and it, my mind never stops. It continues to come through. And see we're living out life right here today. We're living out life right here today and all the things that we have to walk through and all the journeys and all the things. See, we need hope as a church. Susie, I see you're by yourself today and I don't fail to not think that and pay attention to that and the journey you are walking through and we pray for you and for Eddie and love you. You know, and, and I look back at, you know, and see Julia here today and we're thankful, got her family with her and the journey you're walking through today Day is so difficult. Uh, it just, it, does it stop? No, it doesn't stop. I can continue on in, in the things that some of you have going on in your families and, you know, in your lives with, with your, your children. So I told Brother Adam yesterday and he said, Brother Gary, what, what do I even say to my aunt and uncle? What do I say to my cousins? And I said, well, you just let them know that Gary Taylor and Olive Branch is praying for them. And he said, I want you to pray for Devin, my cousin, that, that can't even quit sobbing that he took the life of his own brother. 
by looking at a gun. And, and now he says, why should I live? Uh, listen, friends, everything I've just spoke about is in Christian families' lives, not the lost. Everything I just spoke about, and this is just kind of the cream off the top of the milk that I just spoke about is in Christian families' lives. Right, right, people that we're tied to. Brian, I got your message about... Uh, your, your cousin and and uh, been sending her notes and been sending her private messages and 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 uh, a lady with this lung cancer never smoked a day in her life with three children and and entering into treatment this week and man the journeys and all the stuff uh, you talk about being caught between a rock and a hard place you talk about being in a pickle and sitting on a powder keg you're talking about in a predicament and a catch-22 and in hot water and a no-win situation. But listen to me, in, in a lot of these situations we're talking about, we may not understand what's going on, but God does. And as a people of faith, that's where we've got to have hope in what's to come. And we've got to be careful not to focus on what we see now, but knowing what's to come. See, that's how I persevere. And we talked about it in Sunday school this morning. That's how I can go on. It's not by what's happening today, but by what's going to happen through time. In the end. That's where the hope comes from. That's where the comfort comes from. So this morning as we begin to talk, I want you to know without a shadow of a doubt, no matter what you're walking to, you need to know that hope showed up before you even entered the picture. I want you to understand that hope came on the scene way before you or I were ever even thought about. We were not even a thought when hope showed up. Because our hope is not in this world. And I shared it this morning in Sunday school. No matter how technical you get, we may begin to think about these things. And somebody said, Brother Gary, you have a different perspective on life than a lot of people do. And I might do that. But it's because of where I come from and it's because of my belief system. And I said this this morning, and I, I, those that are here again for the second time, I love my wife with all my heart, but my hope is not in Lori. <coughs> My daughter stopped over at breakfast this morning. She didn't know, realize. She reached down, she kissed me on the cheek and loved me. My hope is not in my daughter. That's very encouraging. Last night I was on the phone with my son. He's been doing an Iron Man retreat. And he's got ten men with him. Some of them are lost men. By the way, two men come to know Christ last weekend in an Iron Man retreat. They gave their life to Jesus. I'm thankful for for that. But as my son was going home to his family last night, you know, we were talking on the phone and sharing some things that happened over the past two days. And right at the end, just like we always do, I said, I love you, son. He said, I love you, dad. And I said, preach the gospel tomorrow. And he said, you too, dad. And no matter what kind of relationship I have with my wife, my daughter, and my son, my hope's not in my daughter and my hope's not in my son. And I was blessed this morning to get up and to walk in the guest room and there's this little britches reaching off the top. His name's Caden Lane and he, his mama didn't get home to late last night so we got to keep him last night. And, and so uh, he said, Papa, good morning. <laughs> and I picked him up out of the little crib and, and he says, thank you. And for an hour he sat in my lap. I'm not getting Papa anymore. I'm getting Papa more than anything. So... Papa, David's Papa, I'm Papa, now I'm getting Papa, but that's okay, I'll take it. As he sat there and touched my nose and touched my lips and touched my eyes and we talked and we read two books, well, his reading is just flipping the pages. <laughs> My hope's not in my grandson. And then when they got in the car to leave right before 9 o'clock to go meet Mandy, my granddaughter gave me a kiss and she said, I love you, Papa. And I said, I love you too. My hope's not in my granddaughter. And they rock my world. But my hope's not in my granddaughter. It's not in my grandson. It's not in my wife. It's not in my son because it's not in my daughter. I'm going to lose every one of them. And I might lose them as I live. My hope is in Jesus my Savior and Lord of my life. My hope's not in this world. My hope's not in the stock market. My hope's not in the prices of bread and eggs. It's not. My hope is in Jesus. 
That's where my hope is at in this morning. No matter what you're walking through, no matter what you're dealing with as an individual, I want you to understand hope showed up before we ever came in the picture. And I want you to know that we're going to still be in a pickle and we're still going to be caught between a rock and a hard place. But I want you to know the Lord will sustain you. He will hold you up. The Lord will be your rock if you let Him. No matter what you're walking through, no matter what you're feeling today, you've got a giant to face. And I preached a message on giants before I left town. You've got a giant to face. And I know your, your, your giant's not called Goliath. I mean, Goliath was a giant. You could tell by his walk. You could tell by his voice. You could tell by his sound. When he spoke, it was like thunder. And your, your, your giant's not Goliath, but it's a giant to you. Your giant may be your health. Your giant may be your job. Your giant may be your addiction. Your job causes problems. Addictions cause problems. Your giant may be your spouse. Your giant may be your kids or your grandkids. Your giant may be finances. I don't know what your giant is. Your giant may be your personality. Your attitude. How you let discouragement and depression come upon your life. Listen. So what you need to know right now, hope is here. The Lord will sustain you. If you want proof this morning, we need to go back and consider those that He has sustained even in the past when they faced, they were insurmountable odds. Watch your ark. What's your ark? That thing that's most impossible to build. That thing that's most Im impossible to, to sell to somebody or talk to somebody about. The ark. Noah had an ark. That was a giant to him. But what did he do? He finished the task that God gave him. He didn't throw in the towel and quit. Even when nobody else believed and everybody else made fun, what did he do? One man can make a difference. Remember that? What's your ark? What's your lion's den? There's man eaters in the lion's den. Amen? There's man eaters at the workplace. Amen? There's man eaters in the home. There's man eaters out there in the world. But they're not too big for God. What's your lion's den? What's your Goliath? Does God ask you to offer your son as a sacrifice? Has he? You're to have faith to carry through and be obedient as Lee preached about last Sunday night? What about to lead a nation like Moses with, with probably a speech impediment and couldn't talk very plain and I can't do that. Some of you still telling God you can't do that. Do what? Well, whatever it is God wants you to do that you keep saying, no, I can't do it. What if Moses had said no? What if Noah had said no? What if Abraham had said No. What if Peter, big loud mouth, Peter, sticking his foot in his throat all the time, quick tongue like me. What if Peter took a back seat? Think about it. Look at all these people that God has sustained. Man, I only gave you like seven out of the entire Bible. I mean, I look at Esther and where she was at. Man, Rahab the harlot changing her ways that God used... The spies, when the, when the other peers were saying, oh, it's terrible, we ought not go in there. And there was those other guys saying, oh, it's a land of, with milk and honey. They spoke the truth. What are we doing? What's our giants in our lives? Do we need to understand hope is here? Our Lord will sustain us. <clears throat> There's one man that I didn't call out, and some of you ladies are studying him right now. So turn to the book of Job chapter 1 and look in Job chapter 1 with me of this man that God really took almost everything that he had except his own life. And, and the reason for it was Satan wanted to turn Job. Because, see, you've got to understand sometimes God doesn't tempt us, but God allows Satan to do things in our lives. He allows him to have some freedom. 
And sometimes it's to see if our faith will change. See, here in the book of Job chapter 1, look in verse 1. There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job, and that man was perfect and upright, and one that feared God and excused evil. Woo! Right there's a mouthful. Can you put your name in there? What's your name? Maybe your name's Tom. There was a man in the land of Webster County whose name was Tom. And that man was perfect and upright and one that feared God and excused evil. Whatever your name is, Steve. There was a man in the land of Hopkins County whose name was Steve. And that man was perfect and upright. What's your name? Jetta. Rachel. Put your name in there. Verse 2, and there were born unto him seven sons and three daughters. That's a pretty good family, isn't it? Ten. Anybody here from a family of ten or larger? Raise your hand. Ten or larger. One, two, three, four, five. Woo! Things have changed, hasn't it? Six. <laughs> Things have changed. Ten. You know what's the Bible say about your uh, quiver? You're blessed if the quiver's full of arrows. Amen? Now what do we do? Oh, we better not have no more. We can't afford them. Oops. Sorry. I better keep going. Said, you're meddling now, am I? What's the Word of God say? I'm not mad. Just read the Word of God. Just, just follow it. Here we are. Ten. That's a big family. His substance was 7,000 sheep. Any of y'all have 7,000 sheep? I'm going to tell you right now, I don't want 7,000 sheep. I'm an ag major, okay? I'm a Murray State ag major. You know the nastiest animal is not a chicken. You may think the nastiest animal is a chicken and, and it's pretty nasty, but I'll tell you one thing. The sheep is the nastiest smelling animal you ever see. Some of you said, no, hogs are. You ain't been around sheep. Shoo, we. Substance was 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 she asses, and a great household, so that this man was the greatest of all the men of the East. The Bible says right there in that verse, he was the greatest man of all the East because of what? His possession, his substance. What he had, he was a rich man, he was a great farmer, and his sons went and, and, and feasted in their houses. Everyone his day sit and called for their three sisters to eat and drink with them. They had a big gathering, family had a family reunion. They all got together and had a big feast. Verse 5, it was so when the days of their feasting were gone about that Job sent and sanctified them, rose up early in the morning, offered burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, it may be that my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. This did Job continually. What, what did Job do? Job went and offered sacrifices and Job went and prayed for his family. Why? Job was the leader of his family. Job was the priest of his family. And even, how many times have I said this? Even though my son is gone and married and even though my daughter is gone and married, I am still that spiritual leader of my home and I still have a responsibility. Lance has taken on the spiritual leadership of my daughter and Chris has taken on the spiritual leadership of Mandy. But I still have a responsibility to them as their dad. So what do I do? I told you already, if you paid attention to my testimony just a minute ago, what did I tell my son last night? Praying for him and told him to do what? <coughs> Preach the gospel today. I remind him all the time. Preach Jesus. He did last Sunday and I got under conviction, so I repented. And that is the truth. I'm the only one that went to the invitation and repented last Sunday morning because of the message he preached. I was there thinking it was the people behind me and I kept saying this is for them, this is for them and all of a sudden, in my mind, God said, this is for you. So I had to repent in my quick tongue. Wow. See, we have a responsibility. So here he is offering up sacrifices, being the example, and this never stops. It never stops for you, me and you. It doesn't matter what happens in our life. It doesn't matter what's going on in our life. We still have a responsibility. Job was praying for his family. He was offering sacrifice for his family. Now, let's go on. Maybe they've sinned. Job did this continually all the time, praying for his family, leading the family. Verse 6, Now there was a day when the sons of God 
came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. So Satan shows up to the Lord. The Lord said unto Satan, Whence comest thou? Satan answered, Lord, from going to and fro in the earth, and from walking up and down in it. And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job? There's none like him in the earth, a perfect and upright man, one that feareth God and eschewth evil. Satan answered the Lord and said, Did Job fear God for naught? Will he fear God when he has nothing? Because right now, he's the biggest guy in the East. Have you ever seen his camel flock herd? All the sheep? All the houses of his sons? What if he didn't have anything? Would he still follow you? I wonder if Satan ever says that about us. If you take away everything we got, will we still follow you, Lord? Woo! Verse 10 says, Have you not made a hedge about him and about his house and about all that he has on every side? Thou hast blessed the work of his hands and substance increased in the land, but put forth that hand now and touch all that he hath, and he'll curse thee to, the fa to thy face. Take away everything you gave him on the earth and he'll curse you, God. I think he's only doing it because of everything you've given him. How many of us may turn our back on God if something bad happens? I've seen it happen, haven't y'all? Have y'all seen things that happen to people's lives and they turn their backs on God? Anybody? Anybody ever seen that as a testimony? Yeah. I've seen people serving God, have some things happen in their life, and bam, they turn their back on God. I know a lady right now, she just popped in my head. I'm not going to call her name. She turned her back on God. Some th terrible things happened in her life. One of them was including her husband. One of them was her son. And now she doesn't even walk with the Lord. Kind of lives the life of a hermit. When he talked to you about the Lord. See, this can happen to us if we're not careful. So when we look at this and we see, hey, it, it, maybe he's just giving you praise and maybe he's just such a good guy, Lord, because of all that you've done. And you've about built a hedge around him. Nothing bad's happened. Verse 11 Put forth thine hand now and touch all that he hath, and he'll curse thee to thy face. Verse 12, The Lord said unto Satan, Behold, all that he hath is in thy power. Only upon himself put not forth thine hand. So Satan went forth from the presence of the Lord. You can touch everything he's got, but don't touch Job. Don't touch him as a man. You can touch everything else he's got. Y'all know the rest of the story. There was a day... His sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their eldest brother's house. There came a messenger into Job and said, The oxen were plowing and the asses feeding beside them, and the sabins fell upon them and took them away. Yea, they have slain the servants with the edge of the sword, and I only have escaped alone to tell thee. You've lost all your oxen, all your asses, and all your servants have been killed. They're gone. And I'm escaped to tell you. Well, it didn't end there. And the story goes that then they took his family, all his sons, all his daughters, all the houses, all the animals, everything's gone. There's nothing left. Wow. See, look, verse 19. Skip down to verse 19. And behold, there came a great wind from the wilderness and smote the four corners of the house, and it fell upon the young men, and they are dead, and I'm only escaped alone to tell you. Then Job arose. He's lost his family. He's lost every possession. He's lost everything and anything. All the houses are gone. All the kids are gone. The grandkids are gone. The entire family's gone. Get the picture? Everything he's got is gone except him as a man. The Bible says, Job arose, rent his mantle, shaved his head, fell down upon the ground and worshipped. Shoo! And said, Naked came I out of my mother's womb, naked shall I return thither. The Lord gave and the Lord had taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In all this Job sinned not, nor charged God foolishly. You notice I didn't read my name in verse 1? Because I'm afraid if I got to this verse, I would have charged God. Why? Because I have asked God why before. 
See, when we look at life, we put emphasis on things that maybe we ought not. Maybe we ought to see the big picture this morning. Maybe we ought to step back just a moment. We need to understand that hope was here before we came around. I mean, frustrated and angry, Job cried and sighed unto God, but yet he kept his faith. How did that happen? Job had hope that the bigger picture was God when it was all over. And I want you to turn to Job 42. I wrote this down, Job 42. So flip way over to the, to the end of Job. Job 42, verse 10. Job 42, verse 10. Now, he's, he's lived the life, he's lived life without everybody and everything and all the possessions are gone. I mean, just think what some of y'all would do if the 401ks and all your pension plans failed tomorrow. What am I going to do? How am I going to live? Think about it. Houses burned down, barns burned down, you have no insurance. What am I going to do? How am I going to live? Job lived. Job kept his faith. Job was frustrated, but he kept his faith. And look in verse 10 through 16 of chapter 42. The Bible says, And the Lord turned the captivity of Job when he prayed for his friends. Also the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. <laughs> what? He'd been living for years with nothing, but he kept his faith in God. And what did God do? Gave him twice as much as he had before. Then came there unto him all his brethren and all his sisters and all they that had been of his acquaintance before and did eat bread with him in his house. And they bemoaned him and comforted him over all the evil that the Lord had brought upon him. And every man also gave him a piece of money and every one an earring of gold. The Lord blessed the latter end of Job more than his beginning. For he had 14,000 sheep, 6,000 camels, 1,000 yoke of oxen, 1,000 she-asses. He had also seven sons and three daughters. He called the name of his first Jeima, and the name of his second Kiza, and the name of his third Karapa. And in all the land were no women found so fair as the daughters of Job. And their father gave them inheritance among the brethren. After this lived Job 140 years and saw his sons and his sons' sons even four generations. So Job died being old and full of days. Blessed. Why? Because of his obedience. If you go back to that verse that we ended with in the first part, chapter 1, he went and worshipped God in the middle of everything that he lost. He went and worshipped. He was obedient to God all through his life with nothing he had. He was obedient. Think about this. If we go to the book of Psalms and we walk through the book of Psalms, we see pain and suffering and humiliation and how everybody endured illness and troubled relationships. I don't know about you, but there's a lot of troubled relationships in life today. Amen? Do you know some of you don't even want to have a friend because you're afraid that relationship will turn sour? There's some of you that build up walls with people because you don't want to let somebody in your life. You've been hurt in the past. There's things. It could be a best friend. I'm not necessarily talking about a love relationship. I'm talking about just a friend relationship. So what do you mean, Brother Gary? I can speak from truth. My wife. We've had friends that turned their backs upon us. Completely. And my wife asked me one day, how can we trust anybody? I said, we can't. We've got to trust only the Lord. But still means we've got to make friends. We've got to have friends. I mean, when we begin to think about it, we put up barriers in our life because of the things that's happened to us. And when we look at Psalms, we read about all these terrible relationships that happen, an unexpected crisis, uh, death that takes place, guilt that happens because of bad decisions, and it all plagues God's people. If I wanted to, I could fall in depression because of all the terrible things I did when I was younger. My years of college, my years as a young man coming out and going back to Muhlenberg County was not that of serving God. I was a hypocrite. I went to church on Sunday morning. I, in a Catholic church, I'd been the altar boy. Men's day, I did the speaking. Why? I was a decent speaker and I knew all the right scriptures to say and the right testimonies, but I lived like Hades through the week, especially on Saturday night. But I was the deacon's son and dating the pastor's daughter. So let him give testimony. Let him lead to singing. Let him give a special. I didn't know how to carry a tune. I'm just loud. 
We need somebody to lead the youth. Gary can do it. I'll do it. Live like a hypocrite. Friends, I'm telling you today, when we begin to think about all these things and all the things of our life, the things that plague God's people. In Psalm chapter 13, we see David. David was heartbroken and he was wrestling with his disappointment. I'm talking about the man, 1 Samuel 13, 14, a man after God's own heart. And then he says, Lord, you're hiding your face from me. You're abandoning me. Let me tell you something. If David said, God, you're abandoning me, I'll tell you right now, I've even said, Lord, where are you today? I've asked that question. Lord, where are you today? I don't feel you today. May I remind you that your commitment to Christ, you don't always feel the Lord. It's not about an emotion. It's about a commitment. I've tried to take that into relationship of marriage. Now, some of you have got perfect marriages and great marriages and y'all said y'all love each other every day of the week, but I know Lori's got out of bed and go, whoo, what did I do? <laughs> There's been days it was only because we said I do and it was a commitment that we stayed together. <clears throat> And there's days that we wonder, did we love each other? And even though I'm a pastor and I'm standing in the pulpit today, I will tell you that there's been some days that I said, God, where are you? And why did this happen? So I know it happens to you too. But then all of a sudden, the lights turned on, I read a scripture, I hear a song, somebody sings a song, somebody posts something and I dig into it just a little bit deeper and the God of heaven begins to speak to me and a heartbroken Gary wakes up, he may be in disappointment, then he sees the face of Jesus and he sees the bigger picture and I know that there's better things to come. Jesus is alive and heaven is real. And all friends, we need to know that he's our hope in a troubled world. <laughs> Psalm 13, 5 and 6, I trust in your unfailing love. My heart rejoices in your salvation. I will sing the Lord's praise for he has been good to me. David was singing unto the Lord. There's the story about Habakkuk. We never talk about Habakkuk. That's a three chapter book with part of the minor prophets in the Old Testament. Habakkuk was during a time that things were going on in Israel. He starts off in chapter 1 and he start, talks to the Lord about hearing the Lord's voice and where is the Lord at and he goes through all that. And Habakkuk is asking God, where are you at? And Israel's in trouble and there's a lot of dark days in Israel's life through those, through those three or four hundred years that they lived on. But then th chapter 3 of Habakkuk, verses 17 and 19, chapter 3 of Habakkuk, 17, 18, 19, he's been asking God, where are you? You're not hearing my prayers. Where are you, Lord? We're troubled. God, why are you letting this bad, why are you letting this other nation take over our nation for and hold us in judgment? And and then here's what he says at the end. Though the fig tree does not bud and there are no grapes on the vines. What's that mean? Farming's bad. This is what this means. There's no fig tree. Uh, the fig's not budding. There's no grapes on the vines. The olive crop fails. Look at it. The fig tree shall not blossom, neither shall fruit be in the vines. The labor of the olive shall fail and the field shall yield no meat. The flock shall be cut. Look at verse 18. In 19, all from the fold, and there shall be no herd in the stalls. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. The Lord is my... The Lord is my... One more time. The Lord's my... Strength. Habakkuk had been two chapters questioning God. Talking to God about the farming's bad. There's no figs and there's no blooms. There's no cattle in the stalls. There's nothing. But even though there's nothing, I'm still knowing that you are God and you are in control and you are my strength. And look what he says here. And he will make my feet like hind's feet and he will make me to walk upon mine high places to the chief singer of my string instruments. I'm going to praise God. Man, we, we, we're just barely through the Old Testament, aren't we? Job, Habakkuk, I mean, it, it's in every book. What is, preacher? Hope! Hope in troubled times. Hope when everything's gone. Hope when everything's depressed. Why? Christ is my rock. And don't you
Don't you think Christ has been through a lot Himself? He came to the world. He walked as a man. He felt the pain. Every time they slapped Him, He felt it. Every time they stuck a, a knife in Him, He felt it. When the spear went in His side, He felt it. When the crown of thorns went upon His head, He felt every thorn in His skull. When they spit in His face, If you'll consider Jesus Christ, He knows all about the, the rock in a hard place. Jesus knows all about the rock in a hard place. Well, the hard place maybe be, would be the cross. Would you think the crucifixion was the hard place? Well, the crucifixion is the worst death, they say, that can happen. That's why the Romans used it. They used crucifixion to kill people. It could be one of the worst deaths that somebody could ever go. That'd be a hard place, amen? What about the rock, between a rock and a hard place? Well, don't forget that Jesus was put, what, inside of a rock, but He didn't stay there, amen? Because He's greater than any rock could ever be. And three days later, after they put Him in the grave. He came out life victorious. And now we can have life victorious. Oh, he knows what a rock and a hard place is all about. Wow. And I want to remind you this morning that we've got victory and we've got hope because one day the man that went through the rock and the hard place named Jesus Christ is going to come back in the air with the, the shout, the voice of the archangel, the trump of God and the dead in Christ shall rise first and all those which are alive and remain shall be caught up together in the sky. And there will forever be with the Lord. H how long? How long? Forever. The hope of this world is not in the things of the world, but it's in Jesus Christ. The victory that Jesus had over death brings hope. Oh, understand, He's the bright and morning star. He's the bright future that's in store for all of us that have claimed Him as Christ and asked Him to come into our hearts. He lives. He lives. Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and He talks with me along life's narrow way. I know He lives because He lives within my heart. You can't take that away from me. Job knew that. Habakkuk knew that. <laughs> Noah knew it. Moses knew it. David knew it. Little scrawny shepherd boy. Three stones. And he killed the, the, the Goliath, the giant. What's your giant today? What's your giant? I forgot a song the other Sunday. Laura Long reminded me. Only a boy named David. Only a rippling brook. Only a boy named David. Huh? But how many stones he took? And one little stone went in the sling. And the sling went round and round. And around and around and around and around and around and around and around. And around. And one little stone went up in the air and the giant came tumbling down. <laughs> What's your giant today? What's keeping you from having your joy? You're, 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 you have no joy. There's no joy in your heart. There's no joy in your life. What's robbing your joy? Don't let it continue. It can be different. Preacher, but you don't understand what I'm going through. You're right. You don't know what I'm going through. I don't know what you're going through, but I know He does. And I know He's our hope. And I know He's our strength. And I know we want to give up sometimes and we want to sit down and we want to throw in the towel, but we can't do that. Christ, with Christ, we are a survivor as we face the ultimate enemy, as we face death itself. Good night. You didn't get out early today. Preacher's back. It's a song God gave me. William Stillman Martin had accepted an invitation to preach at a church a few hours away from his house. When his wife became deathly ill that Sunday morning, he thought he should cancel the engagement and stay home. 
But his young son spoke up. Father, don't you think that if God wants you to preach today that he will take care of mother while you're away? Because of his son's question, he kept the engagement and preached at the little church. When he returned that night, his wife was feeling better and had written a song. Inspired by her son's words, later that night, Martin composed the music for his wife's text. Be not dismayed, whate'er betide. God will take care of you. Beneath His wings of love abide. God will take care of you. Through every day or all the way, He will take care of you. God will take care of you. Through days of toil when heart doth fail, God will take care of you. Of you. When dangers fierce your path assail, God will take care of you. All you may need, He will provide. God will take care of you. Nothing you ask will be denied. God will take care of you. That's an old song written by a lady sick in bed as her husband went to preach the gospel. Wow. Off the encouragement of a son that says, Dad, don't you think if God wanted you to preach that He could take care of Mom till you get back? And God gave a woman a song, God will take care of you. With the heaviness that's on your hearts today, maybe between a rock and a hard place, maybe in a pickle of dealing with life's problems, I want you to know God will take care of you. He took care of Job. He took care of Habakkuk. He took care of all those in His Word. He'll take care of us. There's a giant you need to kill. As our musicians come forward this morning, there's a giant you need to kill this morning. I don't know what your giant is, but you do. Every one of you know. You may not have ever shared. There's some of you here that's never, ever shared your giant. You've never shared it before. But God can take care of you. He can take care of your giant. If you're here today with unbelief, He can take care of you. If you're here that's got something in your life you need to get rid of, He can take care of you. Will you give it to the Lord today? What is God speaking to you about today? What's He saying to you? You're in a pickle. You're between a rock and a hard place. It's a catch-22. You feel like you're sitting on a powder keg. God can take care of you. Would you give it to Him? Because He said His yoke is easy, which means I'll share it with you. I'll help you carry it. Now the most important question today is do you know Jesus? Because that's where all my hope comes from. And that's where your hope will come from. Have you put your faith in Christ? If you was to die and leave this world, would you go to heaven? And you can say without a doubt that I know I'm going to spend eternity in heaven. If not, you need to come today and say, I need Jesus in my life. You need to come and rededicate your life. Would you come? Would you do that? As we focus on the Lord and the movement of the Lord right now, would you think about Jesus in your life right here? Listen to the Lord. It's a very important time to focus and think about Jesus in your life right now. What's your giant that needs to be killed? Justin, as we sing what number? Page 447. 447, as we stand and sing, you come.